so I am so delighted to be here and to share it all with you. Now before I talk more about space, I want to talk about how we actually get to space, because most people really don't understand this. Most people think that we go into space by going up really high. If I had a big rocket engine right here, and I went straight up 600 kilometers into space, I would get there, but only very, very short, for a very short time. Gravity, this huge force of gravity, would pull me right back down to the Earth. So how do we get to space? Speed, going fast. So imagine if you throw a ball in a straight line, you know what happens. Of course, gravity pulls that ball in a curve back to the Earth. The faster you throw that ball, the larger that curve gets. So imagine that you could throw a baseball, or a soccer ball, or an astronaut, so fast that the size of that curve, while they're falling back to Earth, is actually larger than the size of the Earth. Gravity would continue to pull on it, but it would miss. It would just go around and around the world. And that's how we go into space. So it's not about going up high, it's about going crazy, crazy fast. So fast, it is 28,000 uh, kilometers an hour. 25 times the speed of sound. So fast that when we're in space, we go around the entire world in just one and a half hours. In fact, we go around the world 16 times every single day. And it's very unforgiving. When we want to come home, all we do is slow down by just 1%. So when people tell you that it's important to give 100%, there's no better example than when you're trying to not just get to space, but try to stay in space. The reason why talking about speed is so important is that speed is the source of all the risk that's involved in going into space. And it is risky. It is very risky. On my first flight back in 1995, the calculated odds of my not coming home, my whole crew not coming home, was 1 in 100. By my second flight, it was up to 1 in 250. In reality, our space shuttle, there, those were only the things we knew about. In reality, our space shuttle was really about 1 in 50. So those are a lot of numbers. What does that mean? Well, I did the math, and um, in one of the largest airports in the U.S. is Dallas-Fort Worth, and I calculated. If aviation had the same accident rate as space, do you know there would be 10 catastrophic accidents every single day at that one airport in the world. Think about that. Think about that. And it continues to be this risky. In fact, we have new companies, SpaceX, we have Boeing, that are, are developing new vehicles to take crew members into space. And this is decades later, decades after the space shuttle was developed. And still, they're desperately trying to meet the calculated odds of 1 in 270. So it's, as we look forward to space and innovation and going on to new places, going back to the moon, not just for one shot, but actually having people staying at the moon, for going to places like Mars, which is crazy challenging, it is going to continue to be very risky. And all of the new vehicles that are being developed right now, all the new spacecraft, whether you look at SpaceX, um, in fact, just a few weeks ago, they were testing one of their, their escape system for astronauts in their new vehicle, and it ended up being a fireball. Just a few weeks ago. They had another catastrophic uh, 
when you go into space, you actually have to spend a lot of time preparing to not come home. Um, in fact, you have to identify a person in the astronaut office who will be there, who knows where all of your documents are to help your family if you don't come home. NASA's life insurance, in fact, excludes space flight. So one of the things you have to do is meet with Lloyds of London and buy your life insurance. Um, but not coming home is, is not the worst part or the most, uh, uh, you know, your biggest fear in going into space. It's about have, not coming home because of something you did or didn't do. You as a crew member, and in fact all of ground control, you as a team are all focused on having this be a successful mission. And so the night before launch, what you're thinking about is, is there something else I can study? Is there something else I can review? You know, on launch, on the, with the space shuttle, if we had a problem, we had five seconds, five seconds to figure it out, figure out what to do, and do it, or else we were not coming home. One, two, three, four, five. That's it. That's it. And so, not just knowing every nut and bolt and wire, every computer system, every sensor, not only knowing all that, you actually have to get good working as a team. We had checklists, of course. And the same went. There was only two ways to get in trouble with the checklists. The first way was if you didn't follow the checklist exactly to the letter. And the second way was if you did follow the checklist exactly to the letter. And the reason I say that is those checklists, if you have a problem with the system, can only help you for one, Sorry. one problem, one failure. If you have two, those checklists can actually kill you. And so that's why we train for years to be a team to fly into space so that as a team, when those five seconds start ticking off, we will be able to identify the right thing and do it in time. Um, the other thing, once you get into space on launch, you have these very, very powerful engines that are making you go 28,000 kilometers per hour. And once those engines shut off, you are in free fall. You're floating. You're now going around.